Hey, it's FT Live, winter meetings time. It has been insane. Oh my gosh, I can't even take a breath. And there's another trade, another signing. Scotty Braun, AJ Przinski, Eric Kratz. I'm glad I had yesterday off. Oh my gosh, dude. Busy, too busy getting trophies. You know? Do you have FOMO? Of missing yesterday? You're missing yesterday? No, because nothing happened. Oh man, dude. But we were <laughs> recapping the Jared Kelnick trade from the night before. That was huge. It was huge. Huge. For the Marco Mariners. Gonzalez. Yeah, well. Jared Kelnick can now try to win 100% of the game instead of 54%. That's of the a games. big upgrade. That's a, what, a 46% yeah. upgrade. So um, this is usually my favorite uh, image when the winter meetings are slow because it happens pretty frequently. And I do think that eventually we should do something like a trade deadline during this time period to get more activity. But um, if you're listening to the pod right now, this is Eno Saris posting the little sketch of whatever that thing is. Poking something like winter meetings. Kratz, Are you dead? Do something. Do something. This is the best. This is the best. We should, if everybody, if Shohei was traded, I mean, Shohei signed, Soto was already traded, and Blake Snell signed already, like, we'd be like, oh no. It's December, December 5th. We got a whole two months of an off season. We would have nothing to talk about. So this is great. Draw it out. The intrigue is incredible. We got stories of like clandestine like meetings in the place where I got drafted down in the down in the D- Dunedin. People can't even find Dunedin on the map, and that's where their training complex is. If Shohei was there checking out what an indoor indoor batting cages, his locker, and they have a they have a covered they have a covered infield. I mean, this is all intriguing. Yeah, well, that place that's, is nice, though. That place is Listen, super I've nice. Been there Did you see the new version? You've I seen was there two the months ago. Oh, okay. my son. No, they, so here, the this thing, is why we're not at winter meetings. A, Tell I, everyone we're in Florida to report on what's really going yeah. down at winter meetings, which is Shohei Apparently is in our Shohei state right showed now. up in Dunedin for no reason. <laughs> I don't know. I, I just don't understand why they're making this. I know where he's not signing, and we'll tell. Uh, Mike Wilner, when he comes on later, he's not signing with the Blue Jays because the camp already said if someone leaks it there, he's talking to a team, they're out. So guess what? Congratulations, Toronto. You guys are fucking out. The rest <laughs> of the league are in, okay? John Mar- J.P. Morosi reported the Braves are in. Guess what? Mark Bowman said they're out because they talked about it, right? So you know where he is going to sign because nobody's mentioned it? Where? The White Sox. <laughs> uh, <laughs> now, one person on earth has said he's talking to the White Sox. No one Sox. said Vegas A's either. Oh, good point. Yeah. I was like, it took me a minute. I'm like, who the hell are the Vegas A's? They, they need to be. They need <laughs> You'll to get be used re- to it eventually. You got They're just the A's. They're just the A's. Yeah. They don't, right. they don't they want to no be, home. they don't want to be locked to one place. That's true. could be the Sacramento A's. So anyway, just for everyone well, to hey, know. Hold on, hold on, before we get into this. Congrats, yeah. If you were, if you were Shohei's agent, wouldn't you want people to know who you're talking to? Like, especially if you'd be like, oh, we're talking to the Blue Jays. Oh, we're talking to the Yankees. Oh, we're talking to the Braves. Oh, we're talking to the Dodgers. Oh, the Angels are still in it. Doesn't that help your market, or is Shohei just so big that it doesn't matter? I think it doesn't matter. I think the, I think they're only they have everything out there. They have all of his ability and how he'll fit into a team and all of this like marketability. I think the secrecy gives teams like, oh no, if they just talk to the one team in an entire country to the north of America. We have to we have to charge more because now all of a sudden we know that his advertising dollars could be as much as thirty million up there. So they're going to be able to pay more for him than we are here in Dumpland, San Francisco. So we're going to have to we're going to have to push it. This is maybe the one time that the Blue Jays have a leg up on other teams because this guy wants secrecy, and normally teams are like, okay, we have to. The Blue Jays are like, we have to overpay for a free agent to get them to the, come to the North. Now teams are going to be like, oh no, the Blue Jays are in. There's a huge marketing ability, marketability up there. So we got to pay more. So secrecy is great. No, uh, see, I kind of, as a fan, I kind of want to know more though. Like I know this yeah, is Yeah, of course you do, but they don't. His camp says no. And if you say His, anything, that's we'll right. That's why the Blue you. Jays are out. Sorry, Blue Jays fans. Whoever no, the Blue there, Jays didn't leak it. Blue Jays didn't leak it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who leaked it. It doesn't matter. They said if your team is mentioned with them. Also, no. Mookie Betts, though, moving to second base, doesn't that mean they're maybe looking for, for a DH? Well, 
Outfielder my my thing is, I think Toronto did leak it, and here's why. They didn't intentionally leak it. Ross Atkins not being at the winter meetings, doing a sketch rando Zoom call with reporters not saying where he is. Where? What else do you think's going on? And John Schneider, the manager, is doing his session, or he spoke, I think, already today instead of yesterday. That is leaking it. You're not there. You have to lie better for Shohei. You have to say oh, we had a travel issue, our private jet ran out of fuel, and so we had to land in... Dunedin? We had to land in Dunedin? (laughs) Dunedin. So we'll be there in a day or something like that. Uh, I have. I have. Okay. I was 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 there for a 30 for 30 thing? I was there for Charlie Montoya's first few days as skipper, who I really liked, great personality. But yeah, I was there at least once, maybe twice. Because, I mean, it is a dot. But I was... I was also, it is. It's I was like there. Between clear, it's like north of Clearwater. And nobody really, Tarpon Springs, Clearwater. It's not really like, I'd like unless to see you're those. going to the Blue Jays <laughs> to watch a Blue Jays game, you wouldn't even know Dunedin, I don't think is, because there's not, it's not like a huge town at all. Tell me more. Town. I'm Shohei's camp. Tell me more. You're no, I think, dude, so dude I'm telling you, I'm telling you, the minor league, now the big league stadium they redone, but the minor league facility they have there now is top notch. Mm-hmm. I mean, they have every. They got a pitching lab. They got a hitting lab. They got indoor infield. They have indoor everything. They have out four or five fields outdoors. Uh, weight room inside out. The weight room is twenty five thousand square feet. It's gigantic. I mean, with outdoor and indoor, two stories. I mean, it's an incredible place. But I mean, I yeah, but you're, yeah, but you ain't, going, you ain't signing with Toronto to go to the minor league facility. I promise no. you that. And if you and if that's where you're working out, if you're like, oh, I want to work out at the minor league facility. The big league place is five minutes down the road. When I was drafted by the Blue Jays, they redid the entire minor league building, essentially. The field stayed the same, but the building, they redid it. It was brand new. My first year, we got I got drafted and went to mini camp. It wasn't available. We had instructs at it. That was the first thing that was at the brand new building. My last year, they tore it all out and built everything that they have now. And so it was like, that place lasted my entire career. But you still have to drive five minutes over because big league camp starts at the minor league facility. And then you essentially move over to the big league facility, which is nice. They made some adjustments there. But you're still always like driving across town to go over to the big league facility, which is where they play the games, which is kind of like in downtown Dunedin. You guys are just so convincing for Shohei right no, now. No, but we're just explaining like, the Blue it's Jays a blip thing. On the right. I know. I'm kidding. It's a, such a small. But I tell you what, man. Playing for teams, and, and I, when I was with San Francisco, the big league stadium and the where you worked out were two different places. That sucks, man. We just, we used to have to get in our car, get dressed at the big league, drive over to the minor league complex, <laughs> work out, and get back in our car and drive back to the big league complex. It's like That's what stupid. are we doing? This is the major leagues. Yeah, but. I will say this, it's a smart move for Toronto to convince him to come check out a new facility like that because he's coming from the Angel Spring Training facility. Anyone want to comment on that? Dump. Outside the same spot. They're on the same, they do have a, a, yeah, but it's a a cool mountain in left field. They have not put anything into that place. They've been saying, I think, for years, no crats, that they were going to improve it and rebuild it or even find a new home for it. I got to look back to the entire story, but I've heard, you know, from complaining people within the organization, how much of a dump it is and how much it has not changed, even though they promised it would. Shocker. They have a pop-up tent that you get for graduation parties that they put all their weights (laughs) and all the like exercise equipment, their ellipticals underneath so that you can do your exercise and your Pilates with AJ. Like, that's what they pop up, and it's in the parking lot, and there's, like, chain-link fences around it. It's it's tremendous. But I'm sure they're sitting there going, ah, eh, it's only a month. Why would we need to build a new facility? Because you ain't getting Shohei back. Yeah, well, now you got to save because they're not going to make tons of money off of Shohei Otani. That's the whole thing. I think whichever team signs him, they're profiting off getting this player alone between the marketing, the deal with probably NHK to air all the games, et cetera. You can look into all of that. So here's the deal for today, okay? A little bit unconventional because it's winter meetings week. Number one, we're going to talk to Mike Wilner coming up, who's very plugged in on the Toronto Blue Jays. And that'll be in about five minutes. 20 minutes after that, we will talk to the savior of the winter meetings, Kenny Ballgame Rosenthal. And I'll explain why in just a moment. 
And tonight we will be back on for a special winter meetings edition of FT Live at 6.30 Eastern time, whether anything's happening or not. If we have to bring sticks and just poke at the winter meetings for an hour, we'll do it. We'll answer all your questions. We'll bring on more people. So look forward to that as well if you're uh, at work right now and you want a little more when you get home. So the reason that Ken Rosenthal is saving the winter meetings is that last night, for example, from 12 a.m. to 1 a.m., when you're expecting some big news to drop, it happens often at the winter meetings. Of course, nothing's happening. Ken posts not one, but two articles. I'm like, thank you. At least something. And it's got some juice to it. And one of those stories was what we're talking about right now in Shohei Otani. Um, the other one was about the Juan Soto market, which we'll get into in a little bit, too. Let's spend a few minutes on this because we might not have time for it later. Hot corner time on, I guess, the freshest news that we've gotten from Nashville right now, which is in regards to the Angels. And how crazy would this offseason have been if it's Otani, Yamamoto, and other big free agents, Soto traded, and Mike Trout traded? That would have been nuts. It's not happening. Perry Mnagian, who is the GM of the Angels, came out today and said what you're looking at. Um, to the right of me, he definitely will be not will not be traded this off season. And, and even here's the direct quote for you. I dug it up. It's a good one. Mike Trout is not getting traded 100, percent not 99, 100. percent So clearly, in my mind, Kratz discussions have been had already with Trout and front office slash ownership, and they settled on staying and him being the only guy that they can market around for next year, which is going to be a very challenging year for the franchise. Or Shohei called him and was like, hey, is Mike going to be back? Uh, <laughs> if he's not going to be back, then I, you have no chance of signing me. But if he's going to be back, just let me know. And so Perry let him know. 100% no chance. I mean, I would have agreed with that before he said that, but it would have been cool. At least find out what you got. Like, Put your dance card out there. See who wants to dance with you. See if you can do something to upgrade your team. Because just Mike Trout probably ain't doing it unless Rendon can somehow get back on the field and do what he did when he was with the Nets. Yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. Are you not. serious? You really think he can get back to that? I mean, can, can I come out on, on. Did I say? Did I say no, he was no. going to? No, no. Uh, here well, we talked. We've talked about this already a bunch. Should Tr did Trout have the power to go and say, "Hey, trade me"? Yes. And everyone we talked to, including his former manager Joe Madden, was like, "He is not that kind of person." Which I get. Listen, Mike Trout loves Anaheim. He's listen, if I lived in Newport Coast, I'm sure he has a gigantic house right there on the water and goes to Javier's every week and gets a margarita and sits there and watches the sunset. It's a great place, right? But. Man, he's been there since, what, 2011? They never won a playoff game. They're 0-3 in the playoffs, made it once. It's just – it sucks, man. It sucks for Mike. It sucks for the Angels. It sucks for the Angels fan base. Because, you know, you want to see Mike Trout. He would look weird not in an Angels uniform. But at the same time, what Kratz said, if you're Perry Manasian, just just put put the little trolling out there. A little yeah. – see what fish comes up and, oh, maybe a team might make take a bite. And you're like, well, we can't turn that down for Mike. Not only will it clear us money forever, because he signed forever, but also we can get four, three, four, five prospects back and start reloading this organization. Because, listen, if they lose Shohei, I mean, I know they have some some nice pieces. The first baseman was shortstop, the first baseman, the catcher. But they still need pitching. Their pitchers aren't where they need to be. Their bullpen needs help, right? Their, their whole other – they have a lot of holes. And Rendon, if he comes back, great. But, you know, again, it, who knows with him. Uh, but it's just – it's such an organization that is just such a mess right now from the top down. And it's sad because my, I want to see Mike play in the postseason. I want to see Mike and Otani play together in the postseason. Probably not going to happen. I love Wash, and Wash is a great guy, but I love Phil Nevin. He didn't do anything. He couldn't help him. So it's just it's just such a mess. Everything they seem to do, they seem to step on each other. It's like, <laughs> you know, they're, they're walking this way, and then they step on their tail over here, and then they turn around and go the other way. It's just It doesn't make sense what they do sometimes. So – I don't know. I hope it all works out because, like I said, I love Wash. Trout's a great player and a great dude. Uh, I love Phil Nevin, though. Again, he didn't work out. So, I don't know. It's just it's just a mess over there. It's going to be tough for Wash. I'm going to feel bad for him this year. He said there's they got something up their sleeve, though. Did you see that? What? When they asked him about Otani, he's like, I ain't going to give it away. Well, what? why did he say that? I don't know. 
because if you give anything away, no, that's true. you get punished. He didn't want to he didn't mention by name. He's going to the Angels, people. No, you get punished. No, but he didn't mention him by name. He just said he we got didn't He goes, I don't want to comment on that because there's something going on. That doesn't mean he selects you. That just means he doesn't kill you. Oh. Right? He's like a ninja. You're, you're dead to him if you talk about him. Oh, so we're all so, dead. That's why you won't The Angels on the show. are still in the running, even though it's a very low chance. Oh, that he won't come on this show? Because shot? we talk about him every single day, so he won't come on? We haven't. Have we? Uh, we have actually officially asked. <laughs> I was going to say, have we officially asked? I feel like we actually have. Uh, yes, and, every day. And we got to know. But that's okay. Um, all right, so let's bounce around a few other topics before we bring on Mike Wilner and get more into the Otani Soto market. Um, do you want to talk Soto for a sec and the latest here? Because the other Ken article that he dropped um, was about how the Yankees are essentially publicizing what the Padres were asking for felt almost like they're trying to guilt the public into saying, oh, how ridiculous are the Padres for asking for all of these Yankees prospects? And on the other side, it's like 25 years old, top five hitter in the sport, platform season. He's going to be a free agent. You also get a leg up, depending on who the team is, on signing him, which you know, a few people that were on the show mentioned yesterday. Don't forget about recent trades of this magnitude like Mookie Betts and Francisco Lindor. They both ended up signing extensions with those particular teams. Uh, Cody Bellinger is the top position player available on the market. After that, it could be a pretty large drop-off. Sure, Randy Rosarena could be a name that's in the mix to be available as well, but there's not a lot of position player talent that's available. You start adding all of this up, even the Mookie Betts trade, for example, and people are trying to make a comparison there. Do you know how much money the Dodgers took of David Price's contract, that was not just an exchange of names of some prospects, yes, who some didn't work out, Jeter Downs. Connor Wong actually has been you know, a big league catcher. Verdugo has been a big league outfielder for them. It's obviously, you're not going to get to bet status in a trade like that for one season. But you know what a big part of that trade is? More than half of that trade was? 96 money. Million. money. 96 million left. They picked up 48 million dollars. The and Padres are trying to attach maybe Grisham, and he's making he's going to make like four or five. That 48 million dollars. Teams have gotten so cheap. I don't know if any team would even do that again nowadays. And don't forget, they also had to sign Betts to an extension. The Dodgers, right? So not only did they get the 48 million, but they also signed Mookie to what 300 million dollar contract. Yeah, which is what the Red Sox also didn't want to do, which is why they traded him because you know John Henry doesn't have any money. Liverpool makes no money for him in English. <laughs> that you know, Mookie Betts <laughs> in general, though, just not a guy you want to build around. Like, no, he's terrible. Not he's friendly, not positions. versatile. Doesn't do every single thing on the field. You know, probably not going to play well consistently. Hein Bloom only pulled that trade. Only pulled that trade off his first job as a Red Sox. Exec. He was forced to do. Hey, go. That's your job as the GM. But he gets buried for that. But that was what he was told. And to he do. made the playoffs two years later. True. Yeah. And True. He's fired. Listen, the, the Soto thing to me is is, is posturing. There, no team needs him more than the Yankees need him at this point because now the fans are like, oh, Derek, or guy behind the scenes is like, oh, we got to have Soto. I'm a Yankee fan. We need Soto or die. And so, you know, it, it's it's now it's to a point where now that's what the Yankees are doing. Now they're posturing. And no team in the history of baseball has ever overblown their prospects more than the New York Yankees. What was it, Montero, the catcher? Remember, he came out and had like good week. Jesus like, Montero, best player of all time. Center of the Mariners never hit, like played like a week and was like, ah, oh, you're out of here. You know, it's like it, it, the Yankees are great at this. So, I, listen, the Yankees need Soto. I don't know if it's going to happen, but that's where Yankee fans now are involved, and that's when it gets personal. It is a great call. Remember the Oakland trade too. There's a couple guys. I'm trying to remember. Not the Montas one. The one before that. There's like three guys in there that were talked about a lot. I'll find it while we talk to our next guest, but they were hyped as hell. None of oh, them yeah, worked yeah. out. You're talking about the left-handed hitter that broke his knee in – Oh, first game in the White at the yeah. White Sox. At the White Slid Sox. into the oh. electrical box. Yeah, the basically Sox. I haven't seen him, unfortunately, since. Caprillion, I think, was in that deal. James Caprillion. Caprillion. Who was a big Jackson, deal at the time. Had some injuries. And He's still pitching for him, though. Who was that for? Was that was Trevino in that deal? Trevino came over. And someone no, else. No, 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 no. That no, wasn't, wasn't Trevino. No. All right, I'll, was, I'll find uh, it. So, and also, there's people in the Nick chat Swisher. that are about to tell me no. as well. So, wasn't next for um, Anyway, let's bring in our first guest of the day here on FT Live, Mike Wilner, who uh, does a fantastic job covering the Blue Jays and baseball for the Toronto Star, and also the star of the Deep Left Field podcast, which we'll 
tell you more about. And we have a little pretty wallpaper to show about it coming up in just a sec. Uh, Mike, great to have you on. Wow. I will say before it was like kind of official that we found out that Otani is in Florida, we already lined up to speak to you. So impeccable timing to have you on this show for the first time. How are you and how has the past 24 hours been for you? I'm good. I'm uh, I'm at the home office and not in Nashville, so I'm not around all that, uh, you know, constant buzz and searching for Ross Atkins and all that stuff. Well, he's there now. Uh, but but it's you know, it's been really interesting. There have been a lot of people who've wanted to talk to me uh, lately. And, and it's it's kind of cool to have the Blue Jays playing in the deep end. You know, a, a lot of um, a lot of people seem to believe that they're not real major players in free agency, but they've signed some of the most sought after free agents in each of the last three off seasons or, or four. Um, so, you know, they, they've, they're really positioned well, they've got the money and they've improved their facilities to such a huge extent that they are right in the thick of things, I think, in, in the Otani sweepstakes. Wait, Mike, where are you? Are you at the winter meeting? <laughs> Is this a ruse? Have you built this room to secretly, secretly shroud your, your whereabouts so that Shohei does not know you're talking about him? Well, he, he uh, fortunately, I'm not affiliated with the team. So me talking about him, I don't oh, think you're ruins so anything. Good. Yeah. So we're good. So we're good with it. Even though yep. even though you have all those bobbleheads, Shohei might not want to go to the Blue Jays. What does this, <laughs> what does this, all the things you mentioned, the facility, you know, meeting with those things, what do the Blue Jays, what their, what's their number one selling point to Shohei Otani? coming to the six? That's a good question. I don't know what, what I would put at the top of the list. I mean, first of all, you've got, uh, I mean, you remember what the player development complex, such as it was in Dunedin, used to be. Yep. Um, but now it's the best in the sport. And, they, you know, they've they've redone the whole thing. And, and people, new Blue Jays rave about it. Um, it's one of the first things they talk about. They're also redoing the facilities at Rogers Center for the players. It's going to be the biggest clubhouse in the major leagues. They've redone the weight room there. They're redoing all the behind the scenes things that make players better uh, and that make players comfortable. And I think those things are going to be a huge selling point for a guy who, you know, in Japan, Shohei Otani before he came to the major leagues, had the reputation as someone who um, goes to work out, then goes home to read about how he could work out better, and then wakes up, plays, and goes to work out. So, um, you know, the Blue Jays have done everything possible to make Toronto as, an, as attractive a destination, uh, maybe even the most attractive destination for that sort of thing in the major leagues. The other thing is you get to play for a whole country, you know, Toronto Blue Jays fans exist coast to coast to coast in Canada. Uh, you've got 36 million potential viewers watching every game. Every game is televised nationally and you you play for a whole country. And that's, that's a big deal. Uh, I think to a lot of people and you know, the team, they've been in the playoffs three of the last four years. The other time they missed the playoffs by one game and might have been the scariest team in the major leagues at that point when they missed the playoffs. Uh, they've got the best pitching in the major leagues, best pitching in defense uh, last year, and he would add a dimension to the offense that you would think would would get them over the top. There are a lot of really good selling points for him. Okay, Mike. So now that we've established the Blue Jays are out because you guys have talking about them. <laughs> so now let's get into why they should be in. Uh, you mentioned all the facility upgrades. You mentioned all this, but has Drake come on yet? Is Drake has Drake made his case yet to Shohei? Because I feel like if Drake picks up the phone and says, "Yo, Shohei, this is Drake. Come to the six, probably could get him there. So, Mike, I don't know if you know Drake or not, but you should call him. You know, shoot him a tweet or whatever. Get him to call Shohei. Then it's done deal because no one says no to drake right there is a picture floating around uh on social medias of drake wearing a shohei otani all-star game jersey uh it's from the summer but that that might be uh the best we can do but you know the blue jays 
were playing the Angels in Toronto on the day of the Raptors' victory parade uh, five years ago or whenever it was. So, you know, maybe Otani ran into Drake then. Maybe they they uh, exchanged digits and, and Drake is trying the recruitment process as well. Okay, I've seen the facility where they work out. I was the, there at the original facility. They built that. When I got drafted, and then it lasted my whole career, I mentioned it earlier in the show, it's an $80 million facility. Shohei could build his own, okay? Is Shohei going to be comfortable in Toronto? Is there enough of an opportunity for him to not be seen? Because we don't even know the name of his dog. So if he comes to Toronto, is he going to blend in in a city that is – very, you know, a lot of people blend in. It's a lot of population. It's on top of each other. Can he blend in and do what he wants to do, which you had said is play baseball? Yeah, I mean, if he wants to, he can live at the ballpark and just uh, go through the back <laughs> corridors in and out and never leave the footprint the whole time that, that he's in Toronto. Uh, I would hope you would want to go out and explore a little bit wherever he is, you know, whatever city he winds up in. Uh, he's going to be recognized. He's going to be mobbed. There's no way for that guy to really blend in. But, um, you know, up here, it's we have it's a very diverse city. There's a lot of different people from a lot of different cultures and a lot of different backgrounds. And um, there's a little Japan and a little Korea and a little everything. Um, and if he really wants to to be immersed in that sort of thing, he, he can be here. And if he wants to hide, there are places to hide. You know, uh, lots of, I don't know, lots of Blue Jays, but several Blue Jays have lived at the ballpark in the hotel that's attached to the ballpark. And if you want, you never have to go outside on a homestand. All right, Mike. So you mentioned the, the new facilities, but Toronto, from everyone I know that's ever played for Toronto, and I believe Krauts can back me on this, they do more things for their players that people don't hear about, helping them housing-wise, phone-wise, customs-wise with their family, doing little tiny things to help players out. And from what I've heard, I obviously didn't play for the Blue Jays, but every guy I know that went and played there, I mean, maybe one or two was like, ah, but every team has those guys, right? But almost every guy that has played for Toronto has loved it. Do they call in – Current players, former players, and say, show, hey, listen, this is what we'll do for you. This is how we can help you. Again, you have Rogers, the, the, the national company of phone and TV and everything, basically, in Canada. It seems like, obviously, they have the money, but they have the best recruiting pitch other than the weather, maybe, and it's you got to cross the border, right? So it seems like everything would work because Toronto to Japan, I'm sure there's a direct flight from Toronto to – to Tokyo or, or whatever. So, I mean, it seems like a great fit. So, man, I, I mean, I know Canada would love this. Yeah. And, and you know what, it does really seem like a great fit. And I, and I know that I, you know, saying that sitting here in Toronto, trying to sell the city that I've lived in my whole life, it's uh, there's, there's a little bit of a bias too, but everything you, you said is right. And, you know, there, there are people who are reluctant to come to Toronto. There are people who, don't know where it is, who are afraid of Canada and the weather and all that stuff. But, um, you know, the weather here is really not that much different from the weather in any of the northeastern cities uh, in the U.S. or the, um, you know, a Chicago or a Pittsburgh or a Cleveland or Detroit uh, or anything like that. It's probably better than San Francisco in the summer. Um, but, Every player that I've ever spoken to, once they've gotten here, ha has said how much they love it and, and how wonderful the city is, how, like you said, much the team takes care of the players and goes out of their way. Um, the, the family playroom that they built as part of this new renovation is unbelievable. Um, it, it really... It, it really does seem like, like I've, I've never been embedded with other teams, so I don't know what those organizations are like. And, and Eric would be able to speak to it, having played for the Jays and, and played for other teams. But it really does seem like it comes across how well they take care of the players, how well they take care of the families, how much they help. Um, it's, it's a wonderful selling point, all that stuff. All right, Mike. So real quick before we go, do they have the – 
do they have the ability to if they if this does happen with Shohei, you need a six man rotation. So you need five other starters when he does pitch, presuming he'll come back after this elbow mystery elbow surgery that he had and pitch. Will they be able to do that? And then they will be able will they be able to accommodate Guerrero, Bichette, all these other guys they have? Because when Shohei's in the lineup, you can't put oh Vlad has a sore knee. We'll DH him, not put him on the turf. Will they be able to fit him in? Because he kind of takes up a lot of space on your team. And paying all of those okay. guys and keeping Vladdy also and Bo true. for Shohei. Didn't you say they have a separate budget if they get him? Yeah, I think they, they've been led to believe that there's a unicorn budget so that if, <laughs> if uh, they get Otani, uh, that they can make, uh, they can still continue to do what they were going to do with the, with the addition of him. Uh, yeah, it's tough to have a DH only because you're right. You can't give those guys rest. They had Brandon Belt this past season who could at least play a little first base if Vlad needed a, a day off the field or a day off his feet. You're never going to want to do that. Um, with Otani, like if Otani, you would assume would be playing over everybody else, but I think you can, you can make him fit. And the, the pitching is still a year away. You know, does he come back and start? Does he come back and, and close? Uh, Cause you, you're worried about the elbow breaking again. Who knows? But, you know, the Blue Jays, certainly like any team, would be happy to make those accommodations for a guy who's the best player in the game and would be one of the, one of their best starting pitchers. Uh, and just to, one of the other things that AJ mentioned, the Jays have Yusei Kikuchi, who apparently was a hero of Otani's when Otani was growing up and playing through the ranks of uh, Japanese baseball. So maybe they use uh, Kikuchi to, to recruit him a little bit as well. Uh, I think if they were to get him, they would be more than happy to uh, make room for him and and to do the things that they need to do uh, as far as the lineup is concerned to, to make it fit. Hey, Mike, this was awesome. Appreciate having you on here for the first time. Um, just want to plug what you've got going on in your world, too, in addition to the writing, the Deep Left Field podcast hosted by Mike. Um, and it's a podcast from the Toronto Star, which obviously he is the columnist for on the baseball side, coverage, opinion, analysis. And I'm pretty sure I know what they're talking about lately on this pod. So go check it out. Mike, thank you so much for joining us. Great to talk to you and uh, good luck in your coverage here of trying to get some more info out of the Blue Jays right now. That's going to be tough to find things out, but but we'll do our best. Thanks so much for having <laughs> me. I appreciate it a lot, guys. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Appreciate you too. Uh, Mike Wilner with us and... Yeah, I mean, right now, I would say Toronto baseball coverage is at an all-time oh. frenzy high right now. Mm. It is insane. Since uh, we're 2014, to... when, when they signed Russell Martin. In uh, like... This would probably be bigger. But you know what this does? This is the one thing it does limit if they do sign Otani. Joey Votto ain't going there because he can't play anywhere. Yeah, but Otani is DH and Vlad at first. Joey Votto's out. Unless he's coach? Gonna... Just coach. to hang out He's going to be fun. player coach. He helped Will Benson a lot. Remember? That was a good story in Vegas. If you missed that interview. Um, I was there. I'm saying to the crowd. Oh. <laughs> I know you like I'm there. sitting next to you, dumbass. <laughs> hey, the family room in Toronto, he mentioned that. It sucked before. Sucked. No windows. It was like in the crevasse of of. Well, Toronto don't worry, Kratz. That's been was. fixed, okay? And I'm sure if there's yes. anything else we learn about it, Ken will be on there's it for us. There's one problem, though. Otani doesn't have any kids that we know about. No that kids. is true. He doesn't no. care about there's the There's a puppy room. room. There's a puppy room. All right, Ken's <laughs> no. ready to go. go there. FT Senior Insider and host of Fair Territory, Ken Rosenthal, with us right now from an undisclosed location in Nashville, the country of the Opryland Hotel. Uh, Ken, great to have you on. Thank you for saving the winter meetings with not one but two stories late last night since there hasn't been really any news in the past 24 hours. So let's start with your thoughts on Shohei Otani visiting Dunedin, Florida, and uh, this show actually being closer to where the action is than where you are right now. Well, it was really interesting to hear this yesterday, and all day long it seemed like something was going on. Ross Atkins rescheduled his availability for an undisclosed location. He wouldn't tell anybody where it was. John Schneider's availability was rescheduled last Friday from Monday to Tuesday. And then we learned that Nez Bilello, Shohei Otani's agent, was not in the state of Tennessee. And then it was just a matter of finding out where they were. And it turns out they were in Dunedin at the Blue Jays complex. At least that is what I heard and that's what I reported, that that is where the meeting is believed to have taken place. So 
This obviously establishes the Jays as a serious player. They were a serious player before. We've been talking about them for weeks. But this is a different level. And when a guy visits the spring training complex, that's probably to make sure he's comfortable before advancing the negotiations to another level. Now, don't get me wrong. That does not mean the Jays are the front runner. It does not mean anything at all. This is free agency. Anything can happen. The Dodgers are still perceived by many in the industry to be the leading team for Shohei Otani. The Giants are in there. The Angels are in there. The Cubs, to a varying extent, it seems, are in there as well. So I don't know that last night ultimately, or yesterday, ultimately will prove decisive in this process, but it was an interesting development to be sure. Is the excitement of this greater than the chance of this? Or is the boredom of the Dodgers being the team that's going to sign him, which we've said since they didn't sign anybody last year to any big contracts, is that what we're trying to avoid as a, as a baseball industry? Eric, I don't know that there's any master plan in place as a baseball industry. Each team no. is vying for Otani. And the perception of how it goes down and where he went will be based on the eye of the beholder, right? If you're a Dodger fan, you're going to be happy if he goes to the Dodgers. Likewise, Blue Jays. The only outcome that many fans, in my opinion, outside of Adaheim would frown on would be if he goes back to the Angels. That would be something where people would say, whoa, whoa, whoa. I thought you were about winning. That's what you were intending to do. That would be surprising and a little bit deflating, I would expect. But any other outcome, to me, is interesting. And obviously here, the number is going to be really interesting as well. What ultimately are the contract terms? Is it $500 million? Is it $600 million? Where are the opt-outs? How is it all going to work? None of this is known yet, and eventually at some point in the near future, we will know. And Ken, yeah, I'll double down. I think it would be devastating for the sport if he returns to the Angels, because right now they're not in a good spot roster-wise. The best player in the sport, one of the most unique ever, needs to be more on a national stage or international stage and be in the postseason too. Angels' chances coming up this year are not great. Um, so, on Otani and his decision looming, hopefully soon, is that why there has been just about nothing coming out of Nashville besides really that Jared Kelnick trade, which happened on Sunday? Do you now think, talking to others, that he's truly holding up the market, even for players like Bellinger, a Juan Soto trade, some of the, uh, Yamamoto, and some of the other big starters? Um, and I would say even like the mid-tier, like uh, Eduardo Rodriguez, will any of these guys get going or is everyone just waiting for this big decision? Scott, absolutely. This is holding things up. Even on levels below where you just mentioned, the relief market in some cases, certain relievers are being held up. And I know fans sometimes get upset by this kind of thing. It is not the case in other sports, the salary cap sports, which have a much more compressed free agency. But when I hear teams complain about, well, Tony's got to make a decision because we got to get going here. Sorry. Hold on a second. Jeez. No, this Jeez. is never mind. This is good. Never mind. It's nothing. It's nothing. Okay. <laughs> when I hear you Clark's jump us. Oh, who good. was it? If it's good, Ken, it you jump Brian us. Cashman. Okay, Not Andrew, related to nothing. baseball. Don't worry about it. <laughs> when I hear clubs complain, when I hear agents complain about a player or a team holding up the market, sorry. That team, that player has every right to hold up the market, but... If you're asking if all of these dominoes are linked to this one and maybe the Soto trade as well and Yamamoto, yes, those three things are the big ones. And they're all interconnected in different ways. And certainly once one of them and certainly two or three of them go down, you're going to see a lot more movement. So a lot of fans in the chat today asking what we can do to fix this because this is not the first time this has happened with the winter meetings. We've had many duds now in the past. I know sometimes you get like Boris just saying, all right, all my clients going for it right now. But often it's been like this for one player holding it up. Is there anything we can do to change this? I know the winter meetings aren't just about this, but this is a big showcase for the sport. And right now, nothing is happening. Do we try and tweak a trade deadline or would one side or the other never go for something like that? Well, it's complicated. And it's complicated because there is no salary cap. And the union would never want a signing deadline because that would limit the market, restrict it in a certain way. It wouldn't be totally free. You'd have a deadline. What I've always thought would make sense would be maybe a trade deadline at the end of the winter meetings. Now, this would probably be complicated and raise some questions along the lines of the ones I just mentioned. But if you have that, a trade deadline at the end of the winter meetings, 
then free agency would take off after that and you'd be assured of action at the winter meetings. The way the sport is set up now, you're never assured of action at the winter meetings. Sometimes it happens. Remember the one year that Garrett Cole and Rendon and Strasburg signed, signed right away? They were all Boris clients. And even last year, there were some things happening. Aaron Judge happened at the winter meetings last year and a number of other signings. But this is the kind of thing, what we're seeing now, that takes place once in a while. When Harper and Machado were free agents, we saw it drag into February. It's not healthy for the sport. And frankly, for Shohei Otani, it would have been, I would imagine for CAA, his agency, the ultimate to have this announced here, maybe have him introduced here, but they're going at their own pace, which they have every right to do. That's free agency. So I don't see it happening or a change happening anytime soon. Ken, first of all, you know Otani would have got up there and wouldn't have said anything. So, I mean, there's no need to have it at the winter meetings. <laughs> they would have been, here's Shohei. He would have put his jersey on and walked off because he never talked. So he Technology would have, error. Technology, yeah. He could have zoomed. Oh, wait, the technology okay. broke. Sorry, we can't. We can't talk to him. The mic, the mic doesn't work. You can't yell loud enough. But besides that, you talked about a trade deadline. The Soto trade is the other big move that everyone's waiting for, right? Is there? And we talked about it a little bit earlier. Is there ever been a team that needs to make this trade more than the Yankees do right now? Because not only because of their reputation, but now the fans are chiming in, and the fans are like, "We well, Soto or death to Brian Cashman and Hal Steinbrenner." Right? Is what other teams are involved? Because I've seen some fringe teams kind of on the outside, but it's always seemed like it's been Yankees or bust. Yankees are bust. And then in your article, you mentioned about Dave Martinez and, and, and people were talking about Dave Martinez saying like, oh, he's the perfect fit for New York. He can handle it fine. So, so do the Yankees like a done deal? Not a done deal. And the Blue Jays are a team that has been interested. Russ Atkins went on MLB Network Radio this morning. He's the Blue Jays GM and said, yes, they could take on a one-year $30 million player in a trade. It's not something that they're ruling out. I don't know how realistic that would be for Toronto, but that is what he said publicly. And for Juan Soto, there are other teams, I am sure, in the mix as well. And I wrote today about the Padres' side of this, why they would drive such a hard bargain here. And basically, you're talking about a player who is on a Hall of Fame track, who is going to be extremely motivated next season because it's his walk year and he wants a $500 million-plus contract in free agency. And he is one of the great hitters of our time. So from the Padres' perspective, they have every right to ask for a high price, even though there's just one year of control remaining. And if you're the Yankees, you're going to try to keep the price as minimal as possible. So it's your basic stare down, and these kinds of things happen all the time. I think I refer to it as standard negotiating ploys, one way or the other. Does he end up a Yankee? It almost does seem, AJ, like you're right, like they cannot afford not to get him, but you never know. And certainly there are other teams involved. And if the Padres get a better deal somewhere else, Cubs, Seattle, I don't know. I could name a number of teams. No, Seattle. They're funny, so, Ken. <laughs> Seattle. That was a funny year for uh, Seattle. I'm just <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> but, All right. Obviously, the Yankees are not the only team in the mix. Uh, okay. You're fair. Right, I mean, Seattle, Watch Seattle's a great... not been serious on big money, guys. That's true. Yeah, they're trading them we all away them. because 54%. <laughs> but that's all. That's all different. Uh, so, so the question is for me. We had this argument last week. I think Juan Soto turned out four hundred and forty million dollars. Can he beat that on the free agent market? As I mean, Shohei. Listen, I know people are going to say Shohei get five or six hundred million, but Shohei is just such a different animal with the marketing in Japan. But can Juan Soto get five hundred million if he hits the free agent market? And if the Yankees or whoever trades for him. Will that be trade be contingent on them being able to sign him to an extension before not. that trade is finalized? No, I would be surprised if that happened, AJ, because one, that gums up the process, makes the trade more difficult, and two, the entire industry knows Scott Boris is not going to sign Juan Soto to an extension, not going to negotiate with one team when a year from now he can negotiate with 30. That is generally what he prefers to do. People might not like it, but it has proven to be a successful strategy in many cases. When you ask, can he get $500 million? I absolutely believe he can because of his age. Going to be a free agent going into his age 26 season. That is awfully young for a free agent. It's five years younger than Judge was, right? And Judge got the number he got, 360. Shohei, we expect, is going to be over 500. So, yes, $500 million is realistic. Now, how many years? You could spread it over a number of years, right, to lower the average annual value, but... Juan Soto is going to be a coveted free agent at this time next year. There doesn't seem to be much doubt about that. 
And he's probably having a great time looking at what's going on in, in this free agent period where <laughs> Otani might get to 600. Yamamoto price seems right. to keep rising right now. So, so last two here. One is quick, if there's anything on Yamamoto besides the fact that maybe his price keeps going up and we all feel pretty confident that he's going to do these in-person meetings maybe and then sign after that so people can kind of stop asking about him this week. Yes, I don't expect it will happen here for sure. And by Christmas, yes, it's certainly possible. He's not going to need the entire 45 days. What's interesting about him is the market is extremely hot for him. And the reason for that is his age, 25 years old. You hardly ever see a starting pitcher come onto the market at that age. In fact, it's so rare. I cannot remember another one this young being out there. That in fact with his comp combined with his accomplishments, really makes it a unique free agency. Three straight versions of the Japanese Cy Young Award, three straight MVP awards. This guy is the bell of the ball, so to speak. And I wrote earlier this week, I believe that the initial expectation was 200 million, but now the expectation is it's going to be considerably higher than that. So Ken, we'll finish with this one. And you mentioned it briefly. I, I read this from your report. We talked about it a lot yesterday with the Mariners trade with the Braves. Is, is that true that they had some initial conversations with the Rays, but they weren't in the financial situation at the time? Because I, I read that, or at least I'm paraphrasing a little bit from your report, a Rosarena due to make $9 million next year, Parade is due to make $3 million next year. We go from a few months ago saying, can the Mariners shell out $50 million to, for Shohei Otani to, can the Mariners afford a Rosarena and Paredes for $12 million next year? Is it really that dire? And the question that I ask is, Half kidding. Are the Mariners broke? <laughs> I did they report that, Nintendo. Scott. <laughs> but let me give you the context. I did report that early this offseason there was a conversation that took place between the Mariners and the Rays. And at the time, the Mariners told the Rays, yeah, we can't go there financially with some of these guys. But this is why they have cleared so much money. Remember, they did not offer Teoscar Hernandez a qualifying offer. That's $20 million that they didn't even float out there. Then they traded Eugenio Suarez along with the trade that they made the other night with Evan White involved and Marco Gonzalez involved along with Jared Kelenic. Combined in future commitments, that saved $42 million. Not all of it this year, some of it in the years beyond. They did send $4.5 million in cash over, so really the ultimate savings is about $37.5 million. That is a place now where they can go explore some of these things that you were talking about there. And when I really would interpret that as is, guys, when we're talking to the Rays, we can't do this right now. We've got to do some things to clear money before we can get serious. So it's not that they don't have any money and that they're broke, but they are under restraints by ownership. There's no question about that. It's painfully obvious. And Cal Raleigh talked about it at the end of the season. And I know Mariners, executives, and people with the team got upset. Guess what? He told the truth. And he told the truth about a franchise that – you would think after finally ending its 21-year pro season trout in 2022 would have used that as momentum and instead they have stayed stuck in neutral. Yeah, it's a travesty. And we had Cal on the other day and he was like, uh, Depoto probably didn't mean the 54% thing. So yeah, it's tough. They're not going to hear the end of it until they do things. So Ken, appreciate the time. Um, get back after it and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Enjoy the meetings. Thanks, guys. Ken Rosenthal with us from Nashville and also a lot more on Fair Territory, which is out there for the world to experience right now on YouTube or um, wherever you get your podcasts. As you can see, a number of topics, including some that we just got updates on from Ken. Um, and again, I want to remind everyone that we are going to be doing another FT Live special edition a little bit later tonight. The owners and the GMs are on the clock. They have four hours to get some trades and signings done. We'll be back on at 6.30 Eastern. We're still going for a little, just reminding everyone. Also, to use the discount code FOUL, F-O-U-L, for 20% off your first order at TizaEnergy.com. Go check it out for an energy boost. And also, if you're a dipper out there, uh, stop doing that. Tobacco is bad for you. Check out Tiza. Instead, yeah, you weren't on with us yesterday, dude. Mariners fans are losing their minds right now. I Sure. Am I? Wait. First of all, but am I being hard on them, or is or is no? You're not. This insane. This is hard. But just let's also not forget this. We had Cal Raleigh on last week. Okay. We know what he said. We know, and they'll never admit it, that he was told stand down, young man, by certain people. Okay. They're they're denying it, of course. 
But you could tell by Cal's answers last week when we had him on, he was walking the company line. He answered the questions exactly how he had to answer and we had to ask him and, and, and he knew and he answered them the right way. But listen, like I told him when he we had Cal Rowling on, nobody wants to go into the year not thinking your team wants to win every freaking time you take the field, dude. And I know that's not what Jerry DePoto meant, but the way he said it is the way it came across. So I give Cal Raleigh all the credit in the world for coming on, answering the questions, and answering properly for a guy that's a young guy and his Florida State Seminoles just got denied from going to the championship round in college football, which is awesome. I mean, it's heartbreaking. Um, so, you know, it's tough. It's been a tough week for Cal. It has. Yeah, I just, I just can't believe we've gotten to this point where we're talking about $12 million and they're like – uh, we'll get back to you, okay? Sorry, we can't afford it right now. As many in the chat have said, the Mariners are printing money right now. They were top 10 attendance team at the All-Star game, which I know you don't keep all that, but you get some of that. Just a ton of buzz, a lot of fans there, a lot of merch bought. They have some stars, great pitching. Julio Rodriguez, who had a monster second half. There's a lot to like there, except for the fact that really only feel great about three out of nine in the lineup on the card for them. So they've got a lot of work to do. Plus, not to mention this, because I've been thinking a lot about the Mariners, Kratz. When you trade players away, even if they are going to, of course, replace them, depth matters. So if DePoto hangs his hat on one or two guys, like let's say even they end up getting a Paredes or uh, an Orozarena from the Rays, still keep in mind, players get hurt. You need to have very, very sufficient backup options for yourself. It's even why with Atlanta... They bring on Kelnick. I really like Von Grissom as a player. Now, is there a chance that they trade him? Yes. But if not, that's a really valuable player to have. Albies has gotten hurt in the past. There's been some guys, even though they're consistently in there every day when they are healthy, players do get hurt. Grissom's going to be able to potentially play infield and outfield. That's good depth. The Mariners don't have depth at the position player spots right now, and they're trading away that non-existent depth I just don't see them like suddenly filling up their lineup card with all these players and backup options that are going to make me feel really good about their offense going into next year. Do you? Would Would you change your tone if they signed Cody Bellinger and they no. traded for and they traded for Jonathan India? India's not getting traded. We can oh, actually man. talk about that for a sec. Nick Cross uh, said he's not. I getting mean, traded. I, I saw it, but you don't believe listen, it. Everybody, uh, you have an opportunity. You, you do not want to go into the season. With, uh, you know what, our corner piece, you know, I think he's he's the leader of that team now that Joey's gone. But you can make a deal for him. You have pitching. What do the Reds need? You need pitching. And so I'm asking you in a hypothetical, if they sign him, if they get a Randy, Randy or Rosarena, or, I mean, Bellinger's, I think, is a stretch. I shouldn't have said that. There's no there. chance. No chance. No Cody chance. Bellinger goes to Seattle. But they're taking all of this money off the books – to do something. To me, I think we're moving a little too fast saying, okay, they're taking all this money off the books. What if they have a plan? Because Jerry DePoto, he is an absolute tradesman. Whether yeah. he like he like actually moves forward at all during his trades, it's like he just <laughs> likes to move the pieces around. He's like that guy you play chess and he's like, King goes all the way out to L4 and then all the way back to, you know, you're you're just moving your pieces around and you're like, ah, oh, you're at the same spot you just were. But I think we might be making too much of something right now because they have a ton of pitching and teams need pitching. So do you feel different if they make a move based on the moves that they have made? Yeah, I feel different, but I don't feel necessarily much better. That's what I'm saying. If they acquire a Paredes and or a Rosarena, that's a definitely a helpful step. But do I suddenly look at them and go, they're going to dominate. They're better than the Rangers and the Astros. No, they With also got rid of players that were helpful just now too. With their pitching, but they're... Who did they get rid of? They got rid of they got rid of Suarez, Teoscar. They just didn't give him a qualifying offer. So like right. So he, he's not he left. he's not he's not a twenty million dollar twenty point eight million dollar player. So I get that they got rid of that stuff. They got rid of Kelnick's Kelnick. April. So to me, <laughs> like, what have they really gotten rid of? Well, they need offense, and they got rid of Teoscar and Suarez, two of their main offensive weapons. That's the first thing they got rid of. Now they have Julio, Cal Raleigh, J.P. Crawford. Okay. 
But I'm That's saying it. when they add, and what, I'm what waiting for the next guy. By the way, Kelnick for all the struggles, and he definitely has Kelnick to keep a good improving year. against spin. Until right? he kicked a water cooler and broke his foot. He still was an above average offensive player, even despite the struggles. He was so good in April, and you have to keep that in mind. That's how baseball works. Some players blow up for four to six weeks. And you need that at that time. You guys know that. You've all played with players that disappear for a long period of time, no? Here, here's the thing about the Mariners. They've always had pitching. Every always, always, always had pitching. They haven't had offense. And they can't find offense. And then everybody remember there's two players that went to Seattle and couldn't get out of there quick enough. Do you know who they are? Adrian Beltre, first Robinson ballot Hall of Famer probably this year, and Robinson Cano. Remember Robinson Cano went from the Yankees to Seattle, and what did he become? He fell off the face of the earth, basically. I mean, yeah. there was some – extenuating circumstances <laughs> with some controlled substances also involved. But still, his numbers went from New York, and his popularity in New York to Seattle fell. So don't think that agents don't keep that in mind, and don't think that players don't realize that. Like, I love playing in Seattle. It was a great – I love going there. I love the city. I love the everything about it, the vibe. You go into the, the ballpark, it's awesome. I mean, and I always did well there. So it was – I loved going there. But there's a lot of players that go there, and they don't hit the way they hit in other places. Plus the travel. Listen, you can say what you want about the travel. Yeah, you fly oh. on private jets. There's so much more travel from Seattle than any other place in the country. Oh. It wears on you after a while. And Seattle is – is they, they almost have to make a lot of their moves by trades, which is Depoto trades everybody, moves – it's like rotisserie baseball for him. But, man, you know, it, it's hard for them to get hitters, and now they're trading away some of their best hitting pieces or letting them walk. Julio Rodriguez, Cal Raleigh, and J.P. Crawford can only do so much until you've got to find some hitters. If you have to give up some pitchers like Kratz is saying, you might have to do it. Yeah. But you're also going to have to spend money to get guys. You don't You don't think the Reds or the Orioles want any of their pitchers? Of course. Everyone wants their pitchers. Every single team needs pitching. There's no doubt about that. I just think so, what you said nailed it, though. They, they, they've been doing this forever. You reshuffle decks over and over again. You're going to win some trades. You're going to lose some trades. You might trade the wrong pitcher. And then one or two of your guys that you felt really good about – all of a sudden, they're not there for you. It ha it's happened with the Dodgers, who have been always pretty loaded with pitching depth. And then we get to last year, and we're like, where are their pitchers, right? The young guys aren't quite ready yet. The mid-level guy, or the guys that have been in the league for a few years, like a Bueller, that he's hurt, Gonsolin's hurt, right? We've gushed about pitching before, too. My point is, at some point, you have to just make some acquisitions that don't hurt the assets that you have already. That matters. That's what makes a difference, because you're trading away nothing but money to acquire players. And if you're trying to ball with the big boys consistently, I think you have to do that. Otherwise, you're going to go here, and then you're going to die tanking for six years like the Orioles and White Sox and the Mariners did at one point, right? And you're going to keep doing this. If you want a consistent winner, you also do have to spend on your team, at least for right now. They're drastically cutting payroll. I don't see them getting back to the spot, not this year. How about in what, 2016 to 2019, and I'll get you the exact numbers in a second, they're way behind where they used to spend, which is weird given how the team has been successful with their ballpark and their attendance. I just think that's the wrong decision, and that's why they're ultimately going to be stuck like this because they're going to have to trade to manage the budget. That's the first thing DePoto mentioned when they made that deal the other day, financial flexibility. I just I can't get over Ken saying that they had to tell the cheap-ass Rays, we'll get back to you because we can't afford $12 million of two very good players. But this isn't this isn't a Jerry Depoto fifty four percent thing. I know that I'm I'm blaming this ownership is, for this. I'm not blaming Jerry at all for this. I'm this just saying he's given he you you get dealt cards and they're saying hey this is your budget so go trade because you can't buy guys. So this is where Jerry Depoto should be he should be shining. He's like hey I gotta move these pieces. We're gonna trade eventually. We're gonna trade out of our strength to build a more well rounded team. Their pitching could get two – their starting pitching that they have in the minor leagues and some of the guys that kind of have been established in the big leagues could get them two pieces in their lineup. But are they going to replace – so if they get two pieces, they're going to replace Tay Oscar, who had a OPS plus of 106, which is rated as career OPS plus. So you're not re-signing him. You're not bringing him back like – you can get you can get a slightly above average player to replace him, and then you're trading away some of your other pieces to get another slightly above average hitter in like a in like a Westberg or a younger player like um, let's see that was from the Orioles somebody from the Reds 
you get an India and or don't even get an India, get an Encarnacion strand. Like, you know, that, that's they have to do things differently because they're handcuffed by their ownership, which when we went out to the All-Star game, doesn't look like anything is lacking in the dinero category in Seattle. No. No, they also bought the place across the street that Ryan Divish told us yesterday. They bought one of those big ass bars and he says it's printing money. And that doesn't go and this is where the teams start to become, you know, a real estate deal, right? Where you own things, you don't have to report them, you say that the team's losing money, but it's really not because they're making money on the place next door. That's what we're here for, because no one else is gonna talk about this shit. You have to go deeper when you're looking at what's going on. I also want to say this. People in the chat are saying that I'm it's not that players go to Seattle and do worse. It's the perception that they go there and do worse, right? Because people, like, yeah, I know Nelson Cruz went there and did great. Yeah. Right? And, and Beltre, the year he was there, did okay. Cano's numbers were okay until he obviously got popped for the Royds thing. But there's a perception among – and I think Kratz will agree with me that if you're an offensive player and you go to Seattle, your numbers are going to fall. Am I wrong, Kratz? Raul Abana said right field is – Average. Everywhere else is ginormous. So you need to be able to pull the ball with power, which is not a it's not a good swing. If you're pulling the ball with power, it is not a good swing. And it's just an average place to hit. So you have to be able to hit to all fields with ridiculous power. And it's tough, it's tough to hit there. It that nobody's gonna deny that. I just love – I just would love – and I think this is what Scott and, and Kratz here are all saying. I just love one time for Seattle to be like, fuck it. We're yeah. going all in. We've got Julio Rodriguez. We've got Cal Raleigh. We've got Logan Gilbert. We've got uh, Castillo. We've got all these guys lined up, right? Otani was o- that guy. Otani, that's what I'm saying. I would they love to see Canelo. Seattle just be like, fuck it. We're going all – they did it in 2001, okay? They got rid of Alex, and they brought in a bunch of guys, Brett Boone and Mike Cameron and – Suzaki and Ichiro, and it, I mean, they won 116 games, which I don't know if we'll ever see that again. Okay, but they were like, "We're all in, we're going for it," and they lost. They didn't win the World Series. But since that time, that was 2001. They didn't make the playoffs till last year, 22. Okay, and they've always been the fringe team that everybody is waiting for them. You, you talk to people inside baseball, they're like, "Man, Seattle could make any move they wanted if they just pushed the go button," and they never push the go button. It's always like, "Oh, we're gonna just oh try to." It, it's all. It, it reminds you a little bit of the Cardinals because the Cardinals are kind of that team. The difference is the Cardinals almost make the playoffs every year. They're better at it because the Cardinals never also throw their might at everything, right? They never like, we're going to $300 million, $300 million payroll for this year. They're mm-hmm. always like, oh, we're, we're going to stay in the middle of the pack. We're in St. Louis. We're good enough. You're in the NL Central. We're in the NL Central. But the NL West, though, with Houston, Anaheim, I mean, those teams out Texas. there. Texas. Texas. It's you I mean, can't do that out you there. You can't. So I, I would love, and this is what I think you're saying and what I'm saying. I'd love just seeing for them to say, fuck it, full send. Let's see what happens. And go outside Otani. Take over. And just dominate and be like, because the fans out there are unbelievable. There's only one other team out there. It's the Seahawks. Yes. Now, the one thing, uh, the Kraken. Oh, sorry. The hockey sorry, team. Kraken. I forgot. But, That's but also don't forget I know that. I worked for the NHL. I, I think there's something going on. I don't know this for a fact. I think there's something going on that. With their with their uh, RSN, cable money, their cable That's money, everybody. something yeah. with can I borrow sports. This, by the way, no, you can't. No, not what are you at? Twenty percent, bro. I need a little bit. Um, Devish mentioned that yesterday. He had just what? said about how they like raised, like basically, you have to buy like a nineteen dollar a month package to be able to watch the Mariners. You have to buy their like elite package, and there's some there's some things going on with their RSN. But the Mariners have spent. I don't. Well, the know Mariners how own this- their RSN. Uh, I think the Mariners own their RSN. Yeah, see, there's something I, I don't I don't know. No, no, there's about something. Fun, they own. Root? I think they own Root. The Mariners, uh, I think, own Root too. I gotta. Uh, I don't know. Whatever. I gotta That's, do more yeah, research I, I, on sorry, that. Sorry. I also don't care. And also, teams are allowed to lose money for a year because they profit most years, just in case there was an issue, right? Like you're allowed to be down a little bit one year. You know, you don't have to pay like everyone in your family when you owe a team five million dollar checks every year for owning the ball. Club. But, but but my thing, my thing, Crabs, and I think you agree with me is is, yeah, they can lose money. But if they make the playoffs and they sign Otani, think about how much money they'll make on Jersey. The first 24 hours, oh, my gosh, Otani's a Mariner. In, in, if, I mean, you've been to Seattle. There is a huge Asian population in Seattle that loves baseball, loves baseball. 
And remember when they had Ichiro, remember what it did for that franchise when they first brought over Ichiro? And they brought in uh, Suzaki, the closer, and he was throwing those forkball things that no one could hit. I mean, it was incredible. That place was unbelievable. He threw a t- – oh, man, it would be amazing. I don't know how long this ownership has owned this team, but they have gone in on Cano, bust. And recently, Robbie they went Ray. out and got the best free agent available in Robbie Ray. I mean, some people would have said, you know, yeah, obviously it didn't work out. But look, look at how close – they are to a playoff team this year. Robbie Ray doesn't get hurt. Do you disagree with me that they are in the playoffs? I disagree. You think they still don't make yeah, the playoffs? Yeah, I think it was the offense. I, I think Robbie Ray would have been nice. Sure, D- does Robbie Ray get you an extra win or two? I don't know. I mean, dude, their their starting staff was good. I mean, Robbie Ray, yeah, but not all wins, five. Who's better, Robbie Ray or Marco, Marco, Marco Gonzalez? Sure. I mean, clearly. Marco Gonzalez made 10 starts this year, too. Yeah, he yeah. didn't make a lot of starts. He only had 50 innings. By the way, so I guess the M zone, 71% of root. Okay. And also, by the way, I've never, I'm not really in this chat a lot, but when I am, I find out a lot. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what are they saying? Dave Roberts it? apparently admitted they had Shohei at Dodger Stadium the other day. So they're out. So Dodger's out. We're going to run out of teams eventually. White Sox haven't said a word. He's going to slide <laughs> right in. <laughs> They're going to have to somehow get, get Ben Attendee off the books to be able to afford show. <laughs> Problem is they can only afford a one-year or two-year deal because if it goes over 100, they're out. Right. So yeah, yeah, they might only one year, get year, $99 million, Shohei. The White, Sox are, the White Sox are calling the Twins to see if he can pitch for the Twins and hit for the White Sox. So split just, contract. Yeah, split contract. You just send them back and forth. I also know, I heard someone say the other day, and I looked, and I believe it's true. I can't tell about the latest, but um, Otani on Instagram is now following. You know who his latest follow is? He followed yeah. one person the other day. You do Logan know who Webb. it is? Logan Webb. That's right. He followed Logan Webb the other day. So I'm like, well, Ooh. the Giants are out. Otani just outed them that they clearly yeah. have Yeah, spoken, but Logan Webb right? asked him to. He was pissed. He's like... He's like, I can't believe Shohei Otani doesn't follow me on Instagram. And then, boom, Shohei's a follow man him. of the people. Got He's it. out. Giants are out. Well, that was a good run. The, the Giants Blue Jays, <laughs> The Blue Jays are back in. Jose Barrios just has to te- has to let him wear number 17. So, mm. oh, That's mm. fine. They clearly don't respect Barrios that much. <laughs> what do you think, <laughs> <him out? laughs> what do you think, what do you think <laughs> that gift would be? What do you think Shohei would get Oof. Jose? The, the hotel out in center field at the Rogers Center? <laughs> Just the whole hotel? The whole hotel. Yeah. He gets, or he gets the CN Tower. Well, well, that would be my thing is, can you create – an Otani wing if he wants to actually just be there and work out there and avoid, you know, being seen and all of that, right? You don't want to live at, at Blue- the stadium. They, who, Mike just said some players have done that. Show I lived at the stadium that. for a little bit. You lived for, there? For like three days. And it was – it was. look, I love baseball. <laughs> I do not want to see where I'm going to be, you know, working for the rest for the next day and then come back and be like, oh, yeah, like it's cool. It's cool for a vacation. You don't want to live there. Just ask the guys that played there in COVID or that started there in COVID because they were all they were allowed up in the rooms. And then they had to take like this one dedicated elevator, couldn't stop on any floors. And then they walked to the clubhouse like it was you don't want to you don't even know the even though the buildings that you live at in Toronto or like right next to the stadium, you don't want to stay there. It's a hotel room at your, at your job. That's what it is. We stayed there when we played when we were visitors. In the hotel. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the dream, yeah, right? That's the dream. Then you, you bad. walk and you're the there. The hotel was fine. Is anyone late? <laughs> it's hard to be late. It's hard to be late when you're in the same hotel. The same you, just open, you open your window and be like, I'll be down for BP guys. It's yeah. like Vegas. Like you go to Vegas, you know, like you can stay in the casino for like a week and never leave. It's like yep. when you went on a road trip and you stayed in the hotel, it was like you're in Vegas because you never left the Rogers Center, Sky Dome. I do that you when we do the shows at Borgata. just stayed right there. People ask me for recommendations in Atlantic City and I'm like, Borgata. Uh, we never left <laughs> Mandalay. There. We were at Mandalay Bay we never left. I never left. Never left. Studio's there, food's there, uh, party was there, everything was there. All right, so a couple other things we'll get to and I'll, we'll finish with some fan questions and we'll dip. Um, and, and AJ and we will be back uh, at 6.30 Eastern with tons of breaking news, hopefully. The uh, teams have three and a half hours to get something done. So there actually have been, in addition to 
permutation on Trout, a lot of GMs coming out and saying we're not trading player X. So I'll give you two more examples. One is Alex Anthopoulos, like very strongly said, you can wipe any of our long-term extension guys out of your trade talks. They committed to being here. We're not trading them. I buy that. I don't think. And he's like, I don't care what we get offered, right? Uh, Dana Brown, GM of the Astros, also basically said the same thing for a player who is entering his free agent season. On Alex Bregman, he said, I'm not, well, this was actually two quotes I wrote down. One was, I'm not interested in overpaying in the relief market because that's what the Astros should go get. But okay, we'll see what happens. But two on Bregman, we're not entertaining trading Bregman at all. I think that makes sense. The Astros are trying to win this year. Trading Bregman, even if you don't think you're going to sign him, not the move. Plus, Kratz, the Astros generally don't do that. Like Correa, Springer, they play with them until the end. And then if they walk, they walk. You know, and that's worked out fine for them. So I can be as critical as I want on some teams. And maybe I take it too far sometimes on a, on a club like Seattle. But hey, I know what the Astros dealt with or what they did many years ago. Since then, all they do is win and make the right moves. I have nothing to criticize here. I don't think they should trade Bregman. I think you should keep what you have because you have just as good a chance of any team of winning the the whole thing next year. So why would you trade someone like that? You, you know, they don't have to worry about... We got to make sure we get someone back for this. Like they have consistently been able to find guys on the pitching side too. Christian Javier, Fran Valdez, et cetera, that costed nothing in the international market and they have nailed it. So I have nothing critical on this. Yeah. The biggest thing is just that they continue to develop position players. They have that core. They had that core now next year with Bregman leaving. Altuve will be an Astro for life. I don't ever see him leaving Houston, and I think that's cool because he'll be a Hall of Famer and he'll get his 3,000 hits and everything, but I I don't think there's, – there's no reason to trade Bregman because you are a – you're an American League. You're one of the top three teams in the American League going into the season right now, even, even without all these trades and everything going on. They just have to continue to develop position players – so that guys keep coming up and being the Jeremy Peñas, being the Chaz McCormicks, and guys just coming through their system if you're not going to trade a guy like Bregman. Yeah, I, I think they've done good enough on bringing up that next crop. I think a lot of people thought after the you know, Altuve, Springer, um, Correa, kind of group. Uh-oh, they, they could have a drop-off, but like you mentioned, Jordan, Tucker, Pena, who did have a down season compared to the year before, but still, they have still been able to consistently put out talent that you can build around and another core. So, good for them. All right, so let's finish with this. I'll read a few comments that I collected over the last hour, and then a reminder to everyone, we will be back 6.30 Eastern Time live FT special winter meetings edition this evening to see what else is going on and at least kick around some rumors and answer more of your questions. So if you have any, you can either send them in advance to our Instagram with a DM at Foul Territory Show or just come back for the show um, and I'll go through them. So there's there were a lot of complaints early on when we first started about how there hasn't been much going on right now, which is very accurate. So... Uh, Mike, for example, said we need a winter trade deadline and free agent deadline. Hot stove is ice cold right now. Deadline of the strike year was super exciting. This is boring. So I'll tell you this. You'll never have a free agent deadline. That goes against an open market of free agency because you would put players against a deadline to actually sign a contract. You would never, it, you can debate whatever you want. It'll ne never get accepted by the players union. I 100% mm. guarantee that. Trade deadline is possible. I could see both sides being okay with that because that no chance. No, because you need why? something to talk about. You, it's not happening. You would have stuff to talk about. They, nobody's signed yet. So if you do trade deadline up until this point, then the next couple months mm. you focus on signings. No, you can't do that. Why? Because it's a stupid idea. <laughs> that's fine. That's, that's why you can't do it. Even Ken Rosenthal shot your dumb idea down. No, he didn't. He he said a trade deadline at the end of the winter meetings. Yeah, that's but here's Ken the problem. Said. If if a Team A signs Shohei, not the Mariners. Let's okay. say the Dodgers signed Shohei. Well, there's another team out there, let's say the Blue Jays, thought they were going to get them. Well, then instead, if they're already a trade deadline, then they got to make a trade to try to fill the spot that they didn't sign Shohei. Oh, well. You should have traded for Soto yes, already you're, before you're just that. Dumb now. Yeah, you're well, just trying no, to but it's that. a deadline. It forces, it forces teams to go, hey, listen. There is a deadline. It's called opening day. Yes. Guys sign after opening day, too. 
And once guys sign, you think it's boring now, Scott? When guys are all signed, you're going to be like, hey, it's not my first rodeo. I understand. Yeah, so this is this is exciting. This is exciting to hear that Shohei Otani is traipsing around Dunedin, you know, getting some getting some tacos at at Bill's Taco Shack down in downtown Dunedin. Like <laughs> this is this is fun. When he signs, you're gonna be like, all right, well, kind of wish that had lasted longer. Should the winter meetings be pushed back? My whole thing is, I trust no. me. We're in the we're the in the industry. Is more about I know what the winter meetings is more about, but publicly, people, there's a reason why there there are more eyeballs on our show and listeners to our show this week because people expect something to happen when all of these people get together. That's listen. That's as soon what as, here's expect. what I'm saying. This is entertainment, and this is for the fans, right? Everyone always says we play for the fans. We do this for the fans, even if some people are faking it. And according to other fans, your idea is dumb. Fine. <laughs> the the winter meetings part two. No, the winter meetings part is fine. Just I think people have the wrong expectations about the winter meetings. It used to be well, before, obviously, technology and everything has changed it. The winter meetings were like one of the few times all year where everybody got together. GMs get drunk and they make stupid trades. That's what they the don't winter even meetings do that was. anymore because they all stay in their little suite. They don't. The GMs are boring too. 90% they all sit up them. in their suite and they're all hunkered down and they're like, oh, we got our little chessboard and we're gonna move. Pawn A to here and Pawn B to here. You missed poor Bob Nightingale yesterday saying like he'd be out, you know, at the bar for a drink. Bob's been in the biz for a long time, made friends with guys at the winter meetings, having a drink, having a combo, right? It's not like that anymore. You will well, not they find have them in at Orlando. the hotel lobby. I've been a few times the ones in Orlando. Yeah, and how many GMs to... are sitting in the hotel lobby? I was in the one last time in Orlando. There used to be I, more. I was there for some drinks. Do you know how many GMs were there? For the yeah. two or three nights that I was there, and I didn't stay up all night, but for until at least what one in the morning or something, zero. Yeah, but there's other people you can get info from. Yeah, I understand, but I'm saying the the winter meetings. If you go 20 years back, right, it's like Kevin Tower sitting down with Dave Dombrowski, and they're having a drink and they make a trade. I'm just throwing out names of of guys that one who's been around a while or one the late great Kevin Towers who who used to do that. Right, there's stories about guys where they're like they have a drink with them and. They say, hey, let's do this. Let's get something done. Face-to-face makes a difference. It's not like that anymore. Yeah, but it no. used to be a minor league convention where all the minor league teams would get together and be like, hey, check out this new Dizzy Bat Race and sumo suit that I created. And now MLB, being the big bad bully, they're like, oh, well, we're going to take this and we're going to do this. This is this is our thing. And people used to go – people used to go walking around to like be like, hey, I would love to have a job in the game. And – so things change, but if if you go by if you go by Ryan DeBish yesterday <laughs> when he was talking about the place looked like Christmas threw up, like it's become more of a spectacle. And like you said, Scott, nothing's happened. Nothing. So that's all. I mean, it's fine. It, we can still talk all day. Not much has happened yet this off season. We've talked about this on FT before, and we've had plenty to talk about. So that's no problem. Um, all right. So a reminder to everyone, we will be back on, um, six 30 Eastern time. Any final thoughts here before we depart? See in a couple hours, uh, you know, hopefully Shohei signs. Maybe, you know, Shohei might be in Lakeland to meet with the Tigers as we speak. I highly doubt that. Although it would have been nice to hear the Tigers. If Illich, play, if Mike Illich was still alive, they would have been, they in would play. have definitely been in play. Cause yeah. him and Boris had like that. Thing. Remember in, in the Nats used to be a big Nah, they used to be involved. I mean, I know, yeah. I know. Otani's not Boris. I know Otani's though. not Boris, He's but blown. I'm saying, but they were always in on like the big. That was like whoever the big free agent was. It was like, oh, I can go to the Tigers. Oh, I can go to the Nats. Now those teams aren't really doing that anymore. Nope. Now it's like, oh, we got to get the Dodgers involved. We got now we got to get the Cubs involved. Detroit's now it's not like what we it was. Get the Blue Jays involved. No, no. Although, yes, uh, two extensions. You know, what? let's do that in slap. We'll do that as part of slap. Let's slap. <laughs> Mike said, in fairness, some of the drunken stuff in the old days winter meetings would end up as video clips on TMZ today, I would imagine. <laughs> True. So they tell them to stay you, out of the bar. Yeah. You might have to have like a pri- private party, private bar. There, you could set that. That actually would be awesome. Private social event, you know, very classy cocktails with all the GMs that you just put them all in a room and say, hey, let's just for, for a few hours. That actually is a good idea. Just There's- have a good time. You can talk trades. You can talk life, whatever the hell you want. Right. I think that'd be cool. 
I got invited that to a, one of the parties that was happening last night. Not all the GMs. It was it was like companies getting together with a couple teams, and they invite them in. And well, not a couple. Last night it was just one team, and they were like, "Hey, you coming to this party tonight?" I'm like, "No, that's like a 13 hour drive for me. I'm not going to make it." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is good for teams getting together because the staffs are so big. Some of them, they they do all get to spend time face to face when you've got like scouts on the road all year, all that. They do make it important to to bring everyone together and get back on the same page, um, including actually, it sounds like the Yankees need to, which we'll get to in a few hours tonight because uh-huh. their assistant GM spoke. But I don't know if Cashman spoke. If he hasn't yet, he's going to. So we'll get his fresh comments. But the assistant GM said that they've got some some communication issues. So we'll get to that later. We do have manager extensions before that. A quick shout out to our friends at BetMGM. Um, Their $1,500 first bet offer is on using the bonus code FOUL. If you're new to BetMGM, download the app or hit up BetMGM.com. Sign up and deposit at least 10 bucks into your BetMGM sportsbook account. Place your first wager and receive up to $1,500 back in bonus bets if the bet loses. And if that happens, your bonus bets will be available once your initial wager is settled. Gambling problem or concern, call 1-800-GAMBLER. Okay, so lastly, two things, actually, all manager-related. One, um, we had extensions for A.J. Hinch and for Rob Thompson. Cool. Makes sense, right? I mean, they deserve it. Here's Hinch. Extension with the Tigers. Um, That was actually, it already happened a couple months ago. So, A.J., Mm -hmm. we're mad at you for not mentioning that when we had him on like a week ago. Um, But When I asked him if he's going to get his thousandth, if he's going to get his thousandth win as a Tiger or not, that would have been a perfect time to just be like oh yeah because i signed an extension thanks aj i texted him that already appreciate what did he it. say appreciate the heads up he just you should say i'm not working for you unless you break something next time <laughs> on the show when you were sitting on news hinch come on yep. uh, but good good for him uh, it's a good fit there and i think their best years are yet to come during his tenure there i think they're going to be better this year um and then for rob thompson i didn't realize he only had the year to go on the extension that he had signed two years ago. So now he's signed through 2025, which is when a lot of their guys are still signed up through. I know there's some guys super long-term like Harper and Trey, but some of the other guys are on deals that I think expire around the same time, like a Schwarber. Uh, Wheeler's actually up after next year. Man, we're going to talk a lot about Zach Wheeler this coming season. If does it he again. doesn't sign if an he extension, does it again. man, he has been fucking awesome. So uh, congrats to Topper. He's been awesome there for Philadelphia. They should be a pretty strong contender this year. Plus we haven't spoken a lot about the Phillies. Their big move obviously was Nola, but I still think they're going to do something else as well. They're also printing money and they put it back into the team. So I don't think they're going to be completely silent this off season. Does anyone else agree with that? I think they'll do something maybe. I mean, they lost Kimbrell. I think they will be at least in play for Hater, even though everyone says he's already going to Texas. Don't you think that that's a potential fit for them? Hater. If Wheeler says I won't sign an extension, Snell. I think. Wow. You think they'll play for Snell? I think, I think you have to be able to, I think you have to be willing to say what else is available. If you don't sign what we're looking for, we need to make sure we have something after next year. Cause Nola just signed up for seven years. And so I think, I think there's, I, I don't know the relief market. I don't know what the relief market looks like outside of hater, but that would be, that would be a very Dombrowski, Philly type of move, getting an absolute lockdown closer who's used to playing in a small park. Just saying. Oh, we have this from Alden Gonzalez. Dodgers manager Dave Roberts said the team met with Otani in Los Angeles a couple of days ago for two to three hours. Quote, clearly show his our top priority. Go ahead. Go say it. They're out. Why would Dave Roberts jinx his team? There's one team that hadn't talked about him. White Sox. Let's go White Sox. That's not the only team. Half Phillies 20, haven't. Twenty out of thirty teams haven't talked about him, if not more. No, I heard a guy, I heard John Crook say Phillies were in on him the other day, so they're <laughs> out. <laughs> all right. Well, I'll say that every team's in on Shohei if he signs for their price. Are they all out? Well, I mean, the Pirates they could get him on a ten-year, one million dollar contract. They're in. <laughs> Topper should well, have more than a one-year extension, too. By the way, I know. So should like, Hinch. What's the well, deal with Hinch that? Hinch to twenty-five. Yeah. The difference is Topper went to game six of the World Series and game seven of the NLCS in his first two years. And one one year extension? Like, eh. I mean, granted, this is a guy that was looking, you know, he may have been getting out of the game had they not given him a managerial job partway through the season. But 
Like, I, hey, you know what? Maybe he got some extra cheese. But And maybe teams just say, you know what? We're not going past a two-year deal. But he should have gotten more than one extra year. I totally agree. Say it with your chest. You're right. Mm-hmm. He should have gotten a little more. Um, and lastly, uh, before we say bye for a couple hours, we didn't get to this yesterday. And actually, good timing because we can get your word on him. Uh, Jim Leland was elected to the Hall of Fame. The results were released. Oh, nice pick with AJ and Jim. Um, so Jim's 78 years old. He was in tears when he learned about this. Three-time manager of the year, three pennants, managed for 22 seasons, also won a World Baseball Classic title for Team USA. He's the 23rd manager to be inducted. I was surprised. First manager to be inducted since 2014. A lot of Tony time La in the game. 2014. What? Tony LaRusso was 2014. His guy. It was three guys, I think, in 2014. LaRusso was one of them, though. Yes. Um, but Pittsburgh, Florida, Colorado, Detroit. Um, just congratulations to him. Uh, I feel bad for Lou Pinella on the other end. He missed by one vote for the second straight election. Um, and Cito Gaston, too, is another one that should be in consideration. Well, he didn't, but he didn't. It's, the process is super tough. It's super hard, I know. But listen, old Humperdinck. That's Leland's nickname because people don't know this about old Humperdinck. He can sing like lounge songs. So they nicknamed him Oliver Humperdinck, the old lounge singer. So that's what all his friends call him. So he's uh, he's one of the best, man. You saw that picture. I saw him in Detroit this year. I'm so happy for him and his family and uh, just one of my favorite people of all time. And I text him when he got in. I said, Jim, congratulations. I would have voted against you. And he just fired back. <laughs> of course you fucking would. <laughs> Somebody did. Yeah. But he I mean, that, listen, he missed one boat. He wasn't. It's all, yeah, but he's he's. I know man. he's so funny. Baseball lifer. I'm so happy for Jim. Congratulations, and I uh, can't wait to hear what he says. He he managed players. He definitely was not afraid of saying anything to anyone. He was a good <laughs> in game manager. And lastly, I, I mean, I watched and listened to some of the interviews he's done, and we'll try and get him on soon too. Um, this was my favorite quote from him on Monday. He said on on managing players. If you mislead a player, you lose them forever. If you tell them the truth, you lose them for about 24 hours. I thought that was great and just good to bounce off you guys for this show because you've dealt with some some fakes, right, who don't tell you like it is. And you guys always say, just be honest with me. Like, you're an, you're an adult. You're a grown man. You just want to know what the freaking deal is and where you stand, which I think a lot of people can say in life for their jobs in general, how many people work for bosses that are just full of shit. So I just respected that quote a ton. Kratz, you like that? Oh, I love it. That's why he kept getting jobs and that's why AJ Pruszynski wants to get a picture with him. Like it's that personable, being personable and being a player's manager doesn't mean that you're boys, doesn't mean that you hate each other. It means you are the leader, a figurehead that creates better leaders in the clubhouse. So there's he's he's a guy besides besides all the the fact that he would hold his cigarettes and you would never know he's actually smoking them the stories that you hear about him about being the manager that everybody loves except for the people that he fired because he didn't really care about you know if he sent people down like eh, just need to make the team better like it's legendary and it's awesome that he is getting his just due going into the hall of fame one more before we go, because we got a signing. Ken just broke it. Kirby Yates to the Texas Rangers. Good fit. Great fit. The The Rangers are going to work on their bullpen. That is the number one priority for them, right? That's the one part that was a little shaky at times. It was definitely shaky during the regular season. They were able to patch it together during the season. But um, Yates you know, signed that two-year deal with Atlanta. It was two years, a little over eight mil. Um, with the club option, I guess, you know, he gets back to free agency. He had a nice return last year. I mean, you can get like, what? He was rehabbing. What, last year? year? No, no. Oh, yeah. In the first year, the first year they gave him a million and then most of it was backloaded. So about 7 million bucks this past season. 61 appearances, low three ZRA, 80 punch outs and about 60 innings. So that's a damn good year for Kirby Yates. You can be overshadowed when you're on a team that has a strong bullpen like it. That's exactly what the Rangers should be doing right now, right? And it doesn't mean that they're out on Josh Hayes. Watch out for the Red Sox. I know Chris Young's, you know, kind of inherited an owner that's that's spending. But when you put a player in charge, a guy that's been out there, it just creates a different environment. So 
for all you Red Sox fans out there, especially ones that are working here for the show, this is going to be great for you having a player as your GM. Yeah, with Breslow. It's a good call. Right. That's kind of what they're going for there. Oh, no, in your tank, head. But this one is <laughs> this one is completely planned for Shohei Otani. Just because wow. Shohei was there, I wore my Dunedin Blue Jays hat. I wore this more as a Phantom DL guy. Not ILDL because I was on the Phantom DL. Sweating through day games in Dunedin. You got to post that. That'll get a lot of love right now on, on the Show socials. Hay. Show yeah, can have it just, if he wants it. <laughs> people are living on the socials, just waiting for stuff to happen. So are we. We'll see everyone in about three hours, 6.30 Eastern, FT Live, always free on YouTube and wherever else you're watching or listening to us. But hang out with us on YouTube tonight. Um, we'll go over some hopefully signings and trades that emerge in the next few hours. We will see everyone then. And thanks to all the subs um, that we picked up today and everybody that was in the chat. It was, uh, it was full of heat this Fire. afternoon. Fire. Yeah, I love it. We're all about it. Great time of year. See everyone soon, tonight.